Hi guys, I'm here with Mark Keown, Head of uh, Independent Media Sports, and we're going to unpack the, the Buck Camp and the call-ups to that, and then look at the Super Rugby semi-finals. Mark, what have you made of that uh, really initial squad from Rassi Erasmus, looking at his nine overseas-based players that he's called up? Yeah, Craig, uh, how's it? And uh, uh, shout out to Money Man, who's in Toronto, Boston, Cape Town, Toronto. So you'll be giving us his picks uh, on his website uh, a bit later. We'll chat about Super Rugby, but uh, yeah, interesting kind of selections. I mean, there were no Bulls and, uh, and um, Sharks players in it, and I think a lot of the Bulls players will come into the mix. But of those overseas-based players, I think the interesting ones would be, would be Alstad, obviously, and, and Reinach. Marcel could see, I think the biggest thing there has been injury for him. Uh, he's always been on Rusty's radar, but he came back, got injured, came back again, got injured. I mean, you guys did a wonderful piece in SA Rugby magazine on his, on his fight to kind of eventually play international rugby and how disillusioned he was. And at one stage, yeah. he thought it was going to end at Ulster. I think the, the interesting one for me is Reinach. More so, I know Ulster has always been a Rusty favourite uh, when he was director of rugby at the Stormers. He tells a story that if you go into a dark room with one player, the only player he wouldn't want to go into a dark room with is Alstad. He rated him the, probably the toughest and the biggest animal among, raw animal among those guys. Mm. So I think he kind of struggled here with was he a lock, was he a blindside flanker, then went over to France and seems to have found his niche there playing for Toulouse uh, and was really outstanding this season. Again, he's up against, he's in a position where we see his fit, where does he slot him? But it does add depth to it. But Reinach has been there for two, two, three seasons. He's been one of the star halfbacks in, in the UK, yeah. uh, in Europe, when they played in the European competitions. But there seemed to have been a dismissiveness from Rossi about him and about his game. So I think that's a, that's a selection that has been forced purely by weight of performance. And um, through the English media consistently writing this guy up and saying, how is he not in the Springbok setup? I think he was up there among the leading try scorers as well in the Premiership as yeah, well. So uh, yeah, we do have a problem here in, in terms of halfback, but again, I think it's, it's again indicative that there's a lot of faith in Fuff, but there's not a hell of a lot of faith in anyone else. And I know they rate Ambrose Papier and uh, Ivan van Sale and Jan Herschel Jankis, but I don't know if they really rate them that much if they are bringing back a Reiner for, for the World Cup. And then Franz Stein, is he finally going to play a game for us? You know, I'm the, one of the biggest Franz Stein supporters and fans, but this guy should have played another 50 test matches. and. Uh, should have been knocking on Richie McCaw's 148 test kind of door. And yeah. I just wish he wish that we can get the best out of him, that he's involved in these three test matches and that he actually does go to the World Cup. I think he's something that's very important in that box 23, if not as a starter, definitely as a bench option. Yeah, I think interesting with uh, Marcel Kutsia and having uh, chatted to him a, a couple of weeks ago, just before he'd, he'd got called up and had a chat with Rusty, and he mentioned um, the injuries that he'd obviously had to go through in getting back, but he, he always had that like Bok dream in the back of his mind, knowing that, that everything would be worth it if he, could, if he could get back to fitness and had a bit of form, and he did exactly that. For me, him playing number eight, uh, which he does predominantly for Ulster, is a, a big factor with Warren Whiteley under a bit of an injury cloud. So if he can come in as an option at eight, seven or six and, and give Rusty you know, different options in the back row, that's a, that's a big um, you know, plus for him. Uh, Kubis Reynach, like you mentioned, I just think he adds what will be great impact if he's the backup uh, coming off the bench. You know, quite a similar player to Fafa. I think he'd be giving opposition players uh, nightmares before, you know, before they play the box. If you've got Fafa to clerk for 60 minutes, 70 minutes, or whatever it is, and then you bring the pace of Kubis Reynach off the bench. Um, with his experience, uh, like you say, Herschel Yanchis has probably been a standout local scrummy, but Ivan Fonzel and Embrace Papier haven't had particularly memorable 2019 campaign so I think both of those set, um, you know selections or call-ups make like, make real sense and I think they'll probably go towards the World Cup and, and play in the championship. Uh, you know, Elstead for me is the one who's a bit of a bolter but clearly highly rated by, by Rassi uh, and then France Day in offering options at 10, 12, 15 and able to kick 50 meter goals which is really what you want at a World Cup. Just looking at you guys at SA Rugby Magazine and uh, when the squad was announced, and I mean the incredible feedback you guys get on your Facebook pages and, and on the website. Uh, you mentioned Marcel could see a bean and eight primarily there, and we know he can play on the side of the scrum as well. Do you think that was very influential in Rassi in a way, saying to Warren Whiteley there's no guarantees by not selecting him in this initial squad? Because a year ago he was insistent that, that Whiteley was very, very much a part of his plans because of the intellectual capital he brings. Mm -hmm. And the one thing he felt was lacking was functional intelligence in terms of his leadership team and, and Whiteley was so paramount to that. 
Do you think it's that comfort that he's got a fit Kutsia that can come in and worst case scenario he can slot in at eight now where his eight options outside of Dwayne have been very limited? Yeah, well I chatted to Whiteley a, a couple of months ago and, and chatted to him about the, because he'd just come back from injury and he mentioned obviously that he just wanted to get some game time under the belt and in a way it's, his body has just been failing him and he just hasn't been able to get any mileage. Um, Super Rugby comebacks every time he's like kind of got back one game and Niggle kind of picks up and, and um, you know, sends them back to the sideline. So he's going to come back and play a bit of Curry Cup, but it, it just it, that race against time to prove your fitness and your form before World Cup, as much of a leader as Whiteley may be, you know, he's also a specialist eight. Um, could see it for me, offers options throughout that, that back row. Uh, he's quite experienced now. Uh, in a sense, he's also, from my chat to him, seems like he's got you know, good leadership as well. So I think it's just a, um, a good safety net and a good alternative to have a look at. And I think Marcel could see a, definitely playing eight um, gives a backup to to position maybe where else do you go besides Dwayne Vermeule and Dan Dupree has had a good campaign, but they need another option. Marcel could see it probably for me is now the guy to back up Dwayne. I mean, you've traveled with the box the last two years, been at mo most of the test matches. Do you kind of risk a guy like Whiteley uh, aka Dale Stain or 2015, they took so many injured box. Or do you think he's maybe learned from the 2015 campaign and he's looked at the Cricket World, campaign, World Cup campaign and it's a case of you've really got to be fit and you've got to be training to go then. They can always call him in at a later stage if they do have injuries in the, in the World Cup. Yeah, I, I do think that. I do think you, you probably can't go with someone who's 50-50 or 60-40. You've got to go with your, your fit and informed players. And if Whiteley doesn't have the time to prove that, he's probably going to miss out and will, will be one of the unlucky ones. Uh, I think that what he's done is he's, for me, what I take away from his selection of the, the overseas-based players is going, we cannot afford as the Springboks, we can't actually feel our best team without opening the door to overseas-based players, and I'm going to have a look at those that will make us as, the strongest possible team when you go to the World Cup. And for me, that's a, that's a good move. They've changed the whole contracting model. I think that's based on going, we cannot necessarily keep all our players, we will allow some of the seniors to go, except that we cannot compete um, with the, the currency as it is, and instead, we're going to still take our best players if they are abroad. And that's Reyna, that's Kutsia, that's Alstad, and the list goes on. I also think if you look at when, when Heineken picked a lot of overseas based players, I think he picked a lot on pedigree and uh, reputation, and not necessarily form. And I think that's what annoyed people back in this country, uh, as did the, the, the selection of 15 Bulls and not one Lions player for that World Cup when they won the Curry Cup that year. But what I do like about uh, his overseas based selections is that he's acknowledged that the Premiership, the top 14, the Champions, uh, Champions League, that they are of the toughest competitions in the world because he's coached in them and he is selected on form. So if you look at a Chesnan, an Alstad, a Faf, a Reinach, a Marcel, they've really been the form players and obviously the props that we, we turn up props like and lose forwards like no other country does. It's not one player there that you can say that you would say he's been picked because he was a great player here, he's gone overseas, he's been off form for two seasons and he's still in the Bach equation. I, I really think he's got those selections right. The key is going to be to who's his pecking order, one, two and three kind of thing. I think that's where he's still got to do a bit of a juggling act. And, uh, but typical of South African rugby, you know how it works. Things all look great and then you pick a side and they get knocked over in the first game and everything changes. Yep. I mean, Heineke had that wonderful World Cup plan and then they lost to Argentina in, in Durban and the next moment, the side that was supposed to go to Buenos Aires never went. Another side went. Seven of those players went into a World Cup squad. Another seven were out and no one knew what was going on. And we lost to Japan and never really kind of got it back on track. So I think there's a lot of science behind it if you've kind of seen his selections from the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, and I look again, you know, I looked at the New Zealand potential squads, Australian squads. We've seen the Argentinian squad. They play every week in Super Rugby. Uh, we can field a, a a 23 that is competitive with any team in the world. It's what's beyond that 23 that may become a, an issue as the World Cup unfolds. Yeah, in a way it's probably a silver lining in the Super Rugby context that we didn't have any teams progressing to the semi-finals and perhaps we can look at the semis in a minute but you know the Sharks and the Bulls players will now soon join that Bach camp. It actually gives them more time to start their preparations for the World Cup. So a bit of a blessing in disguise in, in some way. You know, for me, what a team was never going to end up in all likelihood having to go to play a final in Christchurch against the Crusaders and win. So there wasn't too much to be gained rather than, than have a Malcolm Marks or another top buck from, from one of the South African Super Rugby sides going and risking them risking an injury in a semi-final or final. We've got them able to go into a Bok camp now and really start focusing on what is the grand prize in Japan at the end of the year. Yeah, I know. He gets an extra two weeks and that's invaluable with his preparation. And they, they're not going from here on in, they're with him till the end of the World Cup. So. Uh, 
I think in, I think there's a little bit of Steve Hansen that would have liked that kind of situation as well. I think he's got accustomed to these Oaks playing through right till the end though and having two or three of their teams there. So yeah, I mean, I think Russell will be smiling pretty much at the moment. Yeah. Uh, Mark, let's just look quickly at the, the two semis and maybe um, we can make predictions and also uh, to the viewers going onto the Money Man website would be a, a good idea. He's going to um, update uh, his predictions and, and punts for the weekend. Um, Jags versus Brumbies. Uh, for me, where do you see that one going? I'll just quickly touch on the fact I can't see the Jags losing at home and with the Brumbies having to, to travel all the way to Argentina. I think the Jags will win quite comfortably by 20 as, as much as that. Yeah, I see the spread is, is four and a half points and uh, you know everything you say points to absolute logic, rational. I think they've won 10 of their last 11 games. Uh, I think the Lions are the only team to have beaten them there and then the Chiefs, I mean, the Lions from South Africa and then the, the Chiefs uh, won there as well. The one thing that does just kind of give the Brumbies a, a glimmer of hope is every time you write off a Wallabies team that's going to Buenos Aires or to Mendoza and you think they're going to get pumped, they somehow technically seem to outplay these guys and they come with a very clever game and they, uh, they manipulate the laws of the game and that. And I was watching the breakdown and the one thing that uh, Mills and Ali Williams and Jeff Wilson spoke about and they were initially Jeff Wilson said it's got to be a 20-pointer for the Jaguars. The Brumbies have run their course. They were shocked that they hammered the Sharks the way they did, five tries to, to one. Uh, they talk about the potency of the Brumbies pack and, the, and the, the intelligence of that side. And they were also unbeaten at home. So I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say they'll either cover the spread or win. And that will be the shock of the weekend. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck to you on that one. I'm, I'm not convinced. I think it's more the travel factor for me. I mean, the Brumbies are on a winning streak of seven games so it's not like they don't come in with form uh, just I just look at how the travel and and the the effect of that and then on the you know in addition the Jags have been in such great form and they've really finished the, the competition strong uh, I think they're gonna make the first final which would be quite incredible yeah. um, so speaking of the the Jags in all likelihood being being favorites to most uh, Crusaders against the Canes huge favorites that undoubtedly the Crusaders heading for that third successive title and we speak of uh, how good the Jaguars have been at home. Crusaders just having a look here, undefeated in the last 29 Super Rugby games on home turf. Can you see any way that the Canes could pull off an upset? I don't think so. And uh, and again, just watching the, the Kiwi Raga shows this weekend, uh, this last week, they all talk about the strength of the Crusaders tight five and the weakness of the Hurricanes tight five. And they felt, looking at the Bulls game, that if it had gone another five minutes, the Bulls would have won the game not even drawn even, that they, they said that there was nothing left of the Hurricanes in the last 30 minutes. So there is a thing of, and I've always felt that about the Hurricanes, they've got some great backs, but they don't really have the best pack. That's why I was surprised when they came to South Africa and they knocked over the Sharks and knocked over the Lions. Um, so I, I think it will be pretty emphatic for the Crusaders. Uh, the spread there I think is 11 and a half or points. I think they'll win by 15 points plus and it will be as, as comfortable as it was the last time they played in the league stages. And then it should set up a great final. Jaguaris in Christchurch and the one thing they've done well in the last years is they've traveled to Australia, they haven't lost. And I think they've lost once in New Zealand in the last two years. So it, they certainly will go, they believe in they can win. And if they did knock over Crusaders in, in New Zealand, wow, what does that set up for the World Cup or for the Rugby Championship? Because the first match that the All Blacks have is Buenos Aires against the Argentinians. Great. Well, Mark, thanks very much. I think we'll leave it there. And uh, as mentioned, check out the Money Man website for the spreads and bets before kickoff.